beyond the sky. It's been a long, 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 long time coming. But I know a change is gonna come. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I go to the movies, and I go downtown, somebody keep telling me, don't you hang around, it's been a long Long time coming, but I know it's gonna come because I don't know what's up there. Me on the sun, it's been a long, long, long time coming, but I know. A change is gonna come. Happy birthday. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, Thank you so much for that, Helen. That's wonderful. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Just Thanks for having me. I'm popping in and popping out straight away. Got another job, going to work now. Thank okay. you. Look out for my time traveling with the jazz queens. We'll do. Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald and Nina Simone. Wonderful. Thank we'll do. Thank you so much for that. Well done. Thank, thank you. you. Well done. Um, bye. I, I just bye 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 Helen. Thank you. Just bye -bye. um, I realised actually that we probably want to record this event, and um, we normally uh, record Guy in a Speaks event. So I press record then. And I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that in joining, um, you're giving your consent to be recorded. Um, but we won't, if there's a Q&A section at the end, we won't, um, we can take it off record. And if anybody has any particular objections to being recorded, we can always edit them out. So you can just let us know um, if, if you don't want to be recorded. But yeah, over to you, um, Juliet. Well, let me just um, pass over to Mia quickly, because I know we loved hearing Helen McDonald sing just now. And there are lots of other opportunities to hear her sing coming up. So, so on the 3rd of November, she's going to be Toulouse-La Trek opposite Borough High Street Tube Station, seven o'clock in the evening, donations welcome. And she's gonna be singing Ella Fitzgerald, Nina Simone and Billy Holiday. Now it's very apt that Helen- Can I, say, can I uh, oh, um, just say that you've got that wrong? I'm so sorry. Go on. It's right. not correct. That was on the 3rd of October. I've just did that gig a month, um, about three weeks ago. The next gig is on the 1st of November. I'm so sorry. First have the That's wrong information right. first of november and it's in borough at saint george um at the martyr seven o'clock yeah oh, lovely st george and the sorry Martyrs. that was my yeah. last gig you were just advertising and doesn't exist because it's back in the time it's called time traveling <laughs> with the jazz queens it's jazz <laughs> and um theater sorry just had to correct right. that can't have that i'm so sorry have a great meeting everybody first of Thank november you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You see, you're so Cheers, busy no doing problem. so many things. We can't keep up with you, Helen. But the first yeah, of November, just get you in put the right address and number. That's all right, St. George's. Thank you. Thank you for Bye -bye. that. Cheers. And it's very apt that you were singing about a change is going to come because tonight, what we're going to be doing is honoring an amazing public servant, Lord Herman Oosley. Not just has he changed and tried to change in the public, the voluntary and the charitable areas, but he's been doing for over 50 years, fighting for equality and cohesion here in the UK. He's been trying to level the playing field in many more ways than one. There's a pun in there, we'll hear a little bit more about sport coming up. And using his powerful powers of persuasion to convince the powers that be to do the right thing, which is not an easy thing to do. An outsider who felt himself a nobody, but begging and hoping to belong, which is the title of his book, which came out not so long ago. Now, born in Guyana, um, in South America, then known as British Guyana, knighted in 1997, made a life here in 2001, have, holding more than 14 honorary degrees, 
and in 19, in sorry in 2020 was made and given the honor of the Pride of Britain Award. That is something that's not just voted for by insiders, but by the public. So our Lord Herman Oosley was voted the Pride of Britain in 2020, an amazing accomplishment. And more so, I'm sure you're gonna talk about it a bit later on when we get on to sport, who actually presented it to you, which was a, a great honor for you and where it was presented. But let's, let's move over to um, talk about some, actually, let's start with talking about some of those early days because it, reading through the book, it's just amazing all the different sort of iterations that you've had during your life. But Herman, I wanted to hear from you, if you don't mind, very quickly and take your mic off to do that. What was it about the early days, the, your parents, your grandparents, your upbringing that led you to this life of public service? You've got your mic on. Can we take his mic off? Herman, take off your mic. You have to do it yourself. Okay. Unmute your mic. Just on the bottom where it says mute, just press it and then it'll come up. So, no. no, can you see it? We can come back to it. Well, but on the bottom, you'll see the that mute. Working now? Can you hear me? Well done. Yes, yes we yeah. can. Loud and clear. Lovely. Well, what I was saying is that it's very difficult to answer that question because growing up as a kid in Guyana, I didn't know much of the background of my blood relatives. Everyone was a relative. I had aunties and uncles and cousins and sisters and brothers, and that that's all I knew. Uh, the reality of coming to Britain and learning more about who were really not blood relatives, but were very much part of that Guyana culture, uh, led me to realize that there, there had to be some distinctions made about who was who. But as far as I was concerned, uh, everyone in the community within Georgetown that were familiar with my close family were people who supported you, who looked out for you, who helped to educate you. Uh, and and that's that was the background. And and once again on reflection and writing the book, I realized how much I knew before I came to England. When I arrived in England though, I felt I knew nothing about England, but also that I didn't learn much in Guyana. But within a week I was wearing a uniform, I was in secondary school. Uh, I was going into a classroom that said this is going to be woodwork later on today and metalwork tomorrow. And I didn't have a uniform, uh, an apron to wear. So everything was new. And suddenly Guyana became almost history instantly for a, a youngster having to cope with so many different pressures. Not only me, but anyone else in the same situation. This clash of culture and coming from one background that's completely different from what you've suddenly been thrown into um, was really a culture shock that was startling. But my mum was, and once again, it only came through to me later in life, she was my mentor. She was someone who moved heaven and earth for me and my sisters there and the two others who were to follow when I came to England. Uh, was she was phenomenal and considering we were poor uh, she was a single parent we almost had different dads what well, we did uh, and how she held that together was quite amazing Herman going back to your book what has given you the most joy in writing it finishing it it's probably the greatest <laughs> Once you get to the end, you think, whoosh. Uh, some people are then inspired to write another one and tell all the things that you, you didn't tell them uh, in the next one, which I'm not sure I've got the energy to do that, but it, there's a lot that's missing. But the important thing for me was to recall the situations I faced that are similar situations that other people have faced during their life in Britain 
born here or coming from the Caribbean or Africa or from other parts of the world and settled here, particularly when it concerns race and inequality and how you're treated and the unequal opportunities that are available and the access to opportunities which are foreclosed. And it was taught, and it was because I got into public service straight from school, starting right at the bottom, it was useful to, in writing the book, do it on a chronological basis of how I built from the bottom my own experience of learning on the job, because I didn't come out of university with a degree. I came out of school and went in right at the bottom, making the tea and doing the errands and all the dirty work that was expected. But learning through that process, both on the job, but also what you call distant learning now. But doing, I was doing a correspondence course and then I was doing a day release at college. All these things were part of building up for what was to come. And, and so working through uh, the, the different jobs and writing the book, uh, helped me to see how, in fact, it was important to incorporate the issues that are relevant of how I overcome, overcame some of the challenges and some of the barriers that other people later on in life were saying they keep hitting their head against a brick wall um, and not getting anywhere. And how did I get there? So I wanted to explain what I did, what was personal to me, how I met some of those challenges. And what are the obstacles that I faced that I couldn't overcome, but, but how I overcome, overcame those that I did. So that it becomes a, a learning experience and education for other people if they chose to read the book, to understand what I did, how I did it, why I did it, what are the outcomes, what's been achieved. I mean, some people will have to say, well, you didn't achieve anything, but uh, there was quite a lot that, uh, of progress that was made. But once you're in a system, as we all are some stage sucked into the system, you're either sucked into it and you comply with it or you're sucked into it and it breaks you or else you can challenge it and try to defeat it. And that's all part of what I've tried to reflect in the book. Now you started off with talking about your early days and uh, it, was, it was quite poignant and sad to hear about the many times you got duffed up on the way from school, duffed up in the classroom, um, you know, in those days, uh, teachers were allowed willy-nilly to just flog boys and girls, you know, for any little small misdemeanor. But somehow there was a spirit that you had that took you on. And that's what, you know, amazes me, really, where that came from. You've spoken about your mother and the family, but not, not just through school, but into the working life. As you say, you started from the bottom, from almost like an apprenticeship level, but you rose through sheer dogged will and strength all the way through to the head of Lambeth, GLC, Ilia, uh, CRE. It's almost like you had some sort of death wish because all of those were some <laughs> of the most difficult <laughs> um, you know, organizations to, to be head of. Well, it, there was never a plan. Uh, if there was a plan, it was very much about doing your best, working as hard as you can, learning from others, uh, which was quite important for me because there was no other basis. Uh, and, and for me, being seen to applying myself in the way that I felt personally was the way to be seen by others who you're working with and around and responsible to would build confidence in pe for people to have in you um, whilst you have your own views about them and they have their own views about you and that working relationship that you sought to establish by building confidence was I think the basis for learning, for succeeding uh, and taking the next step. And the next step were always small steps, but they were important steps. In my first job, the importance about trust and confidence came when my immediate bosses saw that they could trust me more and rely more on me than the other juniors. And so they gave me more work, which could have been seen as punishment for me, but it's because they trusted me to take that on and do it. Now, some people would say, well, you're allowing yourself to be exploited. I didn't see it that way because I saw myself in a position that I had an opportunity and that opportunity meant I needed to succeed. But I also carried as I moved on in, in, in the serious working life mode, 
that there was a necessity to succeed as a black person because there was already, I think I perceived a negative view of who we were and what we represented. We were lazy or we could only do menial jobs, even though at that time I wasn't aware of how many very prominent people over the centuries and also currently at that time who were black from the Caribbean or from Africa who were extremely um, well placed in, in work, although in minorities, but brought exceeding amount of talent to the workplace who were not recognized to the extent that they were. So we were still in a position where we were seen as not worthy of succeeding. And so success and achievements were quite important uh, mm -hmm. as a role model, even though I didn't see myself as a role model. I mean, one of my earliest experiences was hearing a director when I challenged him about discrimination, saying he, he, he doesn't discriminate, but he did once have a black secretary. And that was it. And that tells me what he was saying. I will never have another one. And that, hmm. that tells you, told you everything about him, but also what was going on in the system. And that's why I say you're in the system. You're learning and understanding. You can only beat the system if you learn and understand how it works and how it works against you. Hmm. That's true. And you certainly did that when it came to sport, which I know is something that Mia wants to talk about. Yeah, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Jeff Thompson, the MBE who is the vice chair of the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games Organising Committee. He's, he's a leading youth and community sports activist and has been involved in doing that for the last 25 years. He in turn is going to introduce us to some sporting giants. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mia, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Herman, it's good to see you amongst such illustrious company, reflecting your remarkable life, your remarkable achievements, and what we're now doing by celebrating those achievements, looking at the legacy of impact it has had on the lives of so many. Um, many of you will hopefully know that sport and football in particular is a passion that Herman has not only had personally, but reflected in his public life roles and responsibilities. And a number of individuals from the world of football are here to pay tribute to him. I'll then hopefully do justice to the wider impact that Herman has had on sport and in the lives of young people. But we have with us this afternoon, Gordon Taylor, OBE, the former CEO of the Professional Footballers Association and one, one of the longest serving football administrators in the world of sport. We have Paul Elliott, CBE, one of those who have been inspired and upon whose shoulders Herman stands in what he now does and is responsible to and for in football, serving on the Football Association as one of the leading minds, irrespective of what he looks like, where he's come from, but certainly representing football and its impact in society. Our th second, third contributor, I'm sorry, is Brendan Batson, OBE, currently chair of the PFA charity, former deputy CEO of PFA, one of the founding members of Sporting Equals, but equally, one of the longest serving sports administrators in football and in sport as a whole. But all of those individuals I've made reference to wanted to join everyone this afternoon in paying tribute to Herman's remarkable public life journey. I'm going to start, if I may, by seniority and a face that to many would be an unexpected face in this gathering this afternoon to Gordon Taylor, OBE. Gordon. Thank you, Jeff. And, uh... Good afternoon, everybody. And I just wanted to say it's um, well, it's fabulous to be in such company to wish Sir Herman, Lord Herman, happy birthday, and to be able to speak about the journey that he's mentioned in his life and the journey that I've had with him. It would be some 26, 26, 27, Oh, well over a quarter of a century, but to even go back before then, I'm minded to think of my time as a player, uh, 20 years as a player, but then the opportunity to be involved with the Players Association and mindful at the time of what we needed to do, how we needed to deal 
in the 80s when I was really fortunate enough um, to look to include people like Brendan Batson and Brendan, who's with us here today. And then the involvement of, of black players who were beginning to have a strong place on the field of play. Um, Paul Elliott is with us, of course, and you will all remember Paul as a top quality player. There would be Garth Crooks. We started to really work hard on what was needed and what was needed was to show on the field of play and reflect the cosmopolitan nature of the game. And I was so fortunate to have Brendan and I'm jumping ahead except to say that at that time with the PFA, our lawyer was a certain George Davis who had a close friend with the very lawyer who represented Nelson Mandela in the Revo trials, which caused me to consider seriously the situation in the world and the situation in South Africa and how football is a global game and how we need it to recognize very similar to Sir Herman that the fire in his belly that he's always had was something that I would say was akin, which I hope he will accept, to the likes of Nelson Mandela to have that fire in his belly to fight for what he believed in, but to be also a diplomat who could talk in the highest circles, who had plans of action and considered sport, because I'm coming from the area of sport, who considered sport to be something that it was possible to overcome all barriers of race, religion, culture and creed, and to be a force for good in the world and to give hope to youngsters. And I've just felt that as I've gone on with the PFA and as we've looked to formalize relationships, we had no doubts whatsoever when Brendan approached me about the link in with Sir Herman as head of the Commission for Racial Equality the Kick It Out campaign, which was focused, I believe, in the beginning on anti-racism. We'd lived through the terrible times of the 80s when there was tragedies of Heisel and Hillsborough and, and Bradford, but there were also troubles which we've seen on television today of racism, um, talking even about your Sunday night program and it makes you wonder just how far you know we have moved on which Herman referred to because I you're all aware of how as we're supposed to be making progress not all progress is necessarily good or better when you see the likes of social media and what how that is used and how we need to be in control of that, if it is so effective and so involved in the world, how we, do, we need to use that as a force for good and not as a force for hate and abuse. Basically, we have had our own department with Simone Pound built up in the PFA. We've shown not just words, but with deeds. I've tried to make, I tried to make the PFA staff reflective of our membership, I hope you will have seen how we've tried to set a good example for Britain, for the UK, and particularly my country, England, to be an example to the world. And when you look at the state of play on, on the actual pitch and, and see the, the legacy that people like, going way back to Arthur Wharton, who never got recognised as one of the first great Victorians in sport, Walter Tull, in the very first world war as top quality leader of men and player with Tottenham, Northampton, when officers could not even be black and he was of such quality that he was made an officer. And bringing it forward to the lights when we had John Barnes and Brendan, who I've referred to you, Chris Powell's, as chairman of the PFA 
and working with the PFA. And hopefully we've seen gradually, increasingly, the football pitch reflecting the equality, diversity and inclusion that we needed. Of course, we know as well, we need to work hard that the people on the touchline can be black and qualified and good coaches and good managers. And the same in the boardroom. But I do believe that we were singing from the same hymn sheet as Sir Herman with Kick It Out on what we were looking to achieve and we were looking to change and it was felt one week of action is not enough. When in a similar way, I've been so proud of my players and members of the PFA, when you saw what happened with George Floyd talking about the world as a global village in the USA and very much on our own doorstep, we had Dalian Atkinson who'd been tasered to death and reminding everybody, which I, I know I don't need to do, but of, of the problems that we still have to face with policing and an acceptance of how they should be and how they should behave and to fight for causes. And when at first with the pandemic and we talked about a return to the game and they asked for a tribute to the all national health workers in the center of the field by the players, we also felt that we needed a separate tribute to what was going on in the world, to our fight, which Herman had been so involved in for equality and to make an impact. And that was when we followed the example of Colin Kaepernick in the USA, the gridiron game. And our players agreed to make a special tribute to go back to their positions, to take the knee and the impact that had when the referees followed that, the coaches, the trainers did. And I felt that was particularly moving and it stayed with us to the extent that we even have people trying to boo, people trying to say, now it's outdated, we must move on. But I think it is a continued reminder and it's good that we've seen crowds clap and cheer that happening. And if Herman wonders what progress we did make, we were part of a fight and we were part of a fight that we expect to continue and will never go away. But I think we all have to accept our responsibility, as Jeff has said, with sport. Birmingham, a city I'm very proud to have played for with Birmingham City in the very centre of, of the country. To wish it well with the Commonwealth Games, to continue to fight, to continue to try and make such international events like the Olympics and, of course, the Commonwealth Games and, of course, all such contests to be as inclusive and to show what the world is really made of. And from that point of view, Herman, I want to assure you on this good time for you that you, as a pioneer, have been very much, in my eyes, in the mould of Nelson Mandela, in the mould of those great fighters in the USA, in that mould, and forever to be a role model to follow. Everybody's an individual, but your legacy is that. And I've always felt when we've sung from the same hymn sheet and I've admired your wisdom, that I wanted to keep that fire in my belly, my diplomacy around the table, but a conviction that this fight might have to go on way beyond when we are still alive. But your work will never be forgotten. And it's only, you get only good in this world by building on firm foundations. And you certainly helped to establish and indeed laid the bricks for those firm foundations in sport and above all football. And that's why I would like to both congratulate you and to thank you for the work that you have done. Thank you, Gordon. Gordon Very Taylor. Much enjoyed. And I know, I know Herman will be almost um, modestly embarrassed by way of the tributes we're about to afford him. Very understated, but a titan 
in somebody that off the pitch and within Sport Reflecting Society had the political genius to use it to influence society and change. I'm going to hand over to Brendan Batson, who Gordon has made reference to, a former player on the pitch, off the pitch, who again, through Herman's benevolence and good nature of spirit, was able to encourage him and inspire him to approach Gordon and see that journey begin that saw kick it out lead to what we're now seeing in the symbols that are taken by footballers and sportsmen and women as a whole. Brendan. If that silence means that the age of remote and digital interactivity has worked against us, because I know Brendan was on the move as he was um, joining us this afternoon, I'm gonna pass the tribute ball to Paul Elliott, CBE. Paul will speak about that journey because he was very much part of that journey. The footballer turned football administrator, football activist and servant of sport, Paul. Hi, Jeff. Good afternoon. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I suppose, you know, when uh, considering my journey, my alignment with Herman, um, it, it manifested itself probably in the uh, early 90s when I was then uh, first black captain of Chelsea. And uh, Chelsea, as, as many of our uh, colleagues on the, on, the, on the line will know, had a, let's just say, an unsavoury reputation around racism for a number of years. And I think there was a sort of seismic change when um, back in the uh, early 90s, following my spell in Scotland and Italy, that I, uh, my journey took me to Chelsea. And um, it was a set of circumstances where I was a little bit apprehensive, but obviously there was a veiled messaging within that signing. And, and that was really, uh, believe it or not, there was a, I'm sure a few of my colleagues will laugh, there was a gentleman there called Ken Bates, uh, who was the owner. And if I said to you that uh, he was rather an interesting character, um, he would remember he was the owner of the club in the days when they had electric fences and such like. But he actually said to me that day that uh, he was bringing me in to, to make change, to be a leader, to empower, to inspire, and obviously try on the field of play, set the example to take Chelsea in another direction. Um, interestingly enough, uh, that same year, uh, I, I, I came across Herman. There was a, a function which we met, and obviously we had discussions thereafter. And, you know, I was, I suppose, aligned with Herman in his, in his leadership, in his thinking. I wasn't aware of his 30 years uh, elegant, distinguished, service of the highest order to public and, and his long struggle that became clearly evident way down the line uh, once we got to know each other better and I recall the uh, my generation of, of players the, the the reprehensible repugnant abuse that we all received as players and I think that you know having got to know Gordon more or less at the same time Kick It Out was formed in, in, in the early 90s. Football, unfortunately, at that juncture, felt it was above law, it was above regulation, and probably was in denial as well, if I'm totally candid and honest. I think the, uh, the, the deer is as clear in, 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 in my mindset as I'm trying to articulate that journey and that narrative. The day Kick It Out was born, there was John Fashionew, there was myself, there was Gordon, there was Herman, obviously occupying uh, the, the centre position and, and big John Fashion you as well. And Herman so forcefully and powerfully, you know, spoke about the whole journey that he'd experienced, but why he was here to be a change agent, to lead, to understand this magnificent power of football, what it could do, so much great things, but at this moment in time, at that particular moment in time in 1992, that the way that football was treated, and, and let's be quite candid here, this isn't just a, a minority of people in stadiums. There was a lot of people. I wouldn't say the majority, but I wouldn't say the minority. 
and black players up and down the country in the 80s were subjected to, to a level of abuse that is, that, that is just utterly, utterly uh, unacceptable. But we had to live with it. We had to get on with it. I, I'm a man of West Indian parentage, my family from the Windrush generation. So I understood the struggle. I grew up with the struggle. And during my career in Italy and in Scotland and in England, I played in three uh, prominent countries and I soon realised that uh, the issue of race wasn't uh, a football problem, it was a society problem that unfortunately crossed over into football. So what Herman chose to do was to grab, grab the game by the scruff of the neck. He realises then with no legislative framework, he had a clear mandate to change football, to evolve football, to hold the Football Association to account, to hold the stakeholders to account. And that was beautifully aligned alongside Gordon's strength and character and resilience and aspiration, continual aspiration, which Gordon has had over the last 40 years to do right by his membership. That was the bottom line. So it was a potent, positive, powerful mix. But thereafter, what I can just say to you now, you know, kick it out from an acorn, grew into a tree. Uh, it was remarkable. Herman's strength of character, his, per his personality, his resilience. Because if you have to understand about Kick It Out, it had no statutory or enforcement powers because it's a charity. So this was about Herman using his leadership, his credibility, you know, his, his, his nous, his ability to articulate at the highest orders, you know, when he's at the table, do having the big uh, conversations. But also I saw in a man, the street fighter man, the man, you know, that was tough, was resilient. And, and at times, you know, he would upset a lot of people, but he recognised he was he recognised that was all part of the, the broader understanding of the game. So whilst he was cognizant of the of, of, of the law, you know, he was cognizant of, of the issues and the nuances in football, I think ultimately as well, you know, Herman's ability to engage in the roots of his community, which obviously was the byproduct of his 30 years in distinguished service, uh, uh, you know, in, in the public sector, that brought him in good stead for the challenges. What Herman shrewdly done, he brought in some really good people. You know, he brought in good people around him. There was Piara Power, but also allies like David Dean, David Davis, Brendan Batson, you know, so he knew they were his disciples. So externally, we would still go out and fight and challenge and hold football to account. I think thereafter, how do you measure success? It's always a very difficult one to measure success because you feel like when you look at the issues today in the 21st century, have things got better? I think in areas, yes, and in areas, no. But what we've seen is, there's been a fantastic alignment with Kick It Out, where Kick It Out sits in the modern day game, where the PFA has been so forceful and, and, and powerful in this issue, and more importantly, their membership. We've seen the 21st century player now come out and speak. There's an allyship, there is a res there's a resilience, there's an openness, and that's for a number of reasons because at that juncture in the 80s and the 90s, there was no support. Black players were alone. I was alone. Garth Crooks was alone. Brendan Batson was alone. We were the minority. But there's been a movement of growth. And that I think that consideration, you know, has, has, has been arguably one of the most potent things, but it had to start from somewhere. You had to put a foundation in the ground and build the house. Without a foundation, the house falls over. And I think Herman, his leadership, his strength of character has been central to the evolution of equality, diversity, inclusion, and holding football to account. He knows my estimation of him as a campaigner, as an activist, but also the love of him as a human being. And I wrote something recently, which Roman saw, you know, that, um, that I did for, my, uh, for the Football Association in Black History Month about my icons. The first was my mother, my grandmother, the great Muhammad Ali, whose middle name that I was born with on the same night he beat Sunny Liston. But also there was Lord Herman Hoosley, a man of the most highest order with his humility, kindness, generosity of spirit that has done so much 
not just for English football, but English society. We are much richer for him, for his presence, for his articulation, his leadership and his fight. So Herman, my brother, you know I adore you. I have the utmost love and respect for everything that you've done and what you stand for and with Margaret and the great family behind you. So I thank you for what you've done for us. And um, you know, you're wearing, I take size 12 shoes and you're wearing size 20. So I don't think I'll ever fill your shoes, but you can be sure of my ongoing vigor, leadership, passion and desire to serve football. And if I can achieve 15% of what you've done, I'm still hopeful football will be more better and wiser for it in our community where equality, diversity and inclusion will be the very fabric you know, of English football in years to come. God bless you, Herman, and thank you. Thank you, Paul. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. I think to only build on the stellar tributes that have been afforded Herman reflecting his life in sport and its ability to influence society in his life of public service, I would simply be adding the influence beyond football that he is equally influenced quietly, steadfastly, but almost visibly and visibly making the timely tackles of challenge when they were required, when they were needed, but above all, leaving an indelible mark to everybody that encountered him. For me, no different to Herman, when you were bullied and you stopped running, you had to learn to defend yourself. So whilst playing football was an option, my chosen pathway was karate. And I learned that by defending myself from the National Front and selling my West Indian patties from a Guyanese mother who was equally um, bringing up as a single mother, a family, as a young widow, I learned to find my feet. But as I began to compete for Britain during those 80s, there was always a figure beyond sport that I was always aware of in Lord Herman Oosley. And we all knew that when we competed, whether it was weekend or in major championships, we were not just competing for ourselves. I remember Margaret Thatcher during the 80s after the riot saying sport was for the unclean. I remember challenging her then and she sentenced me to what has now seen eight prime ministers, godless, God knows how many sectors of state, as I can tell you to tell the truth to power in what sport for all should be as a fundamental human right. But that was always influenced by Herman. And in those years, as I started to serve in Sport England, I realized that I had to have allies. I had to have people that I would respect equally, that I'd fought in leading a British team that conquered the world, that would equally lead me and others around him. And Herman did just that. If it was only a brief phone call, if it was a meeting, or if it was the need for him to stand alongside you, Herman would be there, which always gave me an understanding of time management, because I don't know how he did it when he could seemingly be in six or seven places at the same time, having an equal amount of impact. But that he did. And as I became only the third black member of then Great Britain Sports Council, I knew as Paul Stevenson had left it, citing it as being racist institutionally and systemically, that I was going to have to hold my own. But I always knew that Herman was there to support me, to guide me, and give me the experience that teaches wisdom. The Racial Equality Advisor Group, which Brendan Batson equally served on, was to be the footstep that alongside the, the launch of Kick It Out, started to see sporting equals given life to. And that was almost the expansion of football into a multi-sport provision. And it is now, Herman, very much still challenging, advocating, and securing resources that goes into our communities and represents those young people who like us still face considerable challenges. But I think it was 1993 with the shooting of a 14 year old schoolboy. His name was Bendy Stanley on the streets of Moss Side. Herman came to Moss Side when I was trying to get two gangs to stop killing one another. He doesn't know the impact he had that day, but they did put down their guns because they wanted to know why a sir had come to their streets to be interested in them. As a vice president of the youth charter, he was always a reference point as I naively thought that one life would be lost and that would be it. 
throughout that journey, I've encountered many barriers, many obstacles, and many disruptions in trying to see lives saved and given hope and opportunity. But what Herman Usley did in that visit to Moss Side in 1993 was give hope and opportunity. And from tragedy, there is now a global movement. That global movement was because Herman Usley, like Arthur Ashe did in the 80s after the riots, came to the streets of Brixton and he inspired. And that inspiration motivated and it mobilized. And it cannot be overlooked or in any way not recognized or acknowledged. It is a global movement and that is why I managed to survive all that was thrown at me and ultimately become the deputy chair of the Commonwealth Games for next year in Birmingham. That is a result of Herman Usley, because as I walked away from the fight, I realized that he wouldn't have. Sometimes we have to dust ourselves off from the battlefield and then go back. So I'm back on the battlefield, learning the diplomacy, the strategic tactical nous that is required, but never giving up on the values that the late Muhammad Ali knows and characterized his life that I know characterizes Herman's life. Confidence, conviction, dedication, giving, respect, and spirituality. That spirit is a belief that one can belong to and identify with. And I know that these tributes and words, Herman, will resonate with you, to your good wife, Margaret, to your children, your grandchildren. In all of that, you've given so much of yourself to us and still had so much to give to your family. So I'd like to thank God, thank you, and bless you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank that you. Was a great yeah. Jeff, that, that, that was very emotional. Yes, please do. Well, I, I'm delighted, obviously, not knowing what to expect today, that you brought along some people who I have the utmost respect for, for what they have done. And it's nice to hear them saying how much they appreciate what I have done, but it's important that they understand that Throughout my entire working life and the experiences that I've got, uh, I've spent a lot of time learning from these same very individuals who've just spoken and others. And my early appreciation of what had to be done came from learning from others. And I, it was only as a result of going out and listening to other people speak. A lot of black academics and warriors whose lives have gone uh, we've just taken up the baton and been moving it on in different ways, facing new challenges, different challenges, winning some, but losing uh, uh, many others. And what we are seeing as a result of what Jeff and Gordon and Paul have done and what they're doing is they're helping to bring along the next generation, the ones who are now speaking out, the ones who we've got to place our hope in, and that's been referred to, uh, and quite frankly, I've always seen my experiences as one to pass on to others so that they can learn from that. Not necessarily because it's the most appropriate way, but it's understanding as much as we can about what we're up against and what are the various ways of tackling these. I remember when Colin Powell was Secretary of State for the US uh, and he came to Britain in 1997 and he said when we were told, and he was head of the military at one stage uh, in the USA, and he said, that he said quite clearly the day when the USA announced that segregation would be over at 08 hours the next morning, that segregation was over, that that was the time to organize. It wasn't the time to celebrate and think we have won segregation is over, but that was the time to seize the moment, to organize, to plan, to strategize, and to look forward to executing the actions that were necessary to try to move the situation on. And all I've done, and I appreciate what has been said, is to add my little contribution and help others to see a way through uh, and learn from that process which I'd engaged in, which is learning from others. And I must say, I appreciate all those people who I listened to who didn't know who I was and probably thought I was a non-entity in a room listening to these 
warriors or academics and people who I was in awe of and you will have heard their names over the years. Um, but what I took away from that was how much I still had to learn as I still am learning today. And I'm in, in awe now of Jeff and what he's doing and Paul and what he's doing. And obviously Gordon and I are, are now taking a back seat because we need that. But we still, as Gordon said, have that fire in our bellies because uh, if you've got the energy, we'd get out there and still be fighting. But uh, my priorities are slightly different now. But it doesn't mean to say that I don't admire the youngsters now who are speaking out, who are showing out, who are displaying their skills and their talents, who are articulating the world as it is now, uh, and who represent uh, a blackness and a color that we can be proud of in what they're doing. Um, but we also link that back to where it's all come from. And we've learned from each other to develop the instincts and the enthusiasm and the energy and the insights to take the agenda forward. So thank you all for that contribution. I love you all, as, as you know. Uh, that, that's lovely, Herman, really excellent. And it was brilliant to hear about all, all those amazing tributes from sport. But I'm afraid we're not stopping there. You've, you've had so many iterations throughout your life that we can't just stop at sport. You mentioned the warriors and especially the warriors in academia. And we've got quite a few who want to pay okay. tribute to you. Um, some of the young ones, you know, who want to pay tribute to you. We, we've, um, we've got two young ones who are doing amazing stuff in the highest echelons of academia at Cambridge and Oxford. And they both yep. want to pay tribute to you. One of them is online here with us and the other one has sent a tribute. Um, and um, you know, of course, I'm talking about Lord Simon Woolley who's taken mm. over at Homerton College, Cambridge, and who's absolutely gagging to have a word and to pay his tribute to you now. So Lord Simon Woolley, please. Thank you, Juliet, and, and, and thank you, Mia. I mean, this, this last hour has been so incredibly moving. And um, what, what struck me is, Herman, my, my brother, is that um, it's rare to see somebody that is touched so many people's lives. I mean, in, in the most profound way. And even when we're praising you, you want to give it back again. You know, you say, it's not about me, I'm just doing my job. Uh, you see right there, right there, when Herman says that, that's how you see supreme leadership. That's leadership. Uh, dedicated to giving selflessly. Uh, What's extraordinary when I hear Paul and, and, and Gordon, and I want to now pay tribute to Juliet and Mia, because Herman, you will know that you will have heard um, people saying wonderful things about people when they're dead, <laughs> when they're no longer with us. And uh, what Mia and Juliet have done is to tell you why whilst you're very much alive. <laughs> <laughs> whilst you're whilst you're strong spiritually lovingly as an ox and I, I just think it's fantastic to to hear to hear that I mean you know I've got a little video so I'm going to be another 30 seconds but um when I was a nobody I want to tell the audience when I was a complete nobody a nobody a volunteer for Charter 88 I beat a path to this man's door and said, would he speak to me about race inequality? And his secretary gave me half an hour. He spent over two hours with me, two hours, and said, look, young man, I was then, this is what you need to do, this is how you need to be focused. But our relationship didn't stop there. It lasted, it's lasted for over 25 years. And just the other day when he seen me get an award, he was the first one to text me, my brother, my brother, this is what I expect you to do. When I joined the House of Lords, I felt in my heart, in my bones, that the one man I wanted to lead me in the House of Lords was Herman. Not just because he's a friend, not just because he's been supportive, but in Herman's own thinking, it's about succession planning. And when he said to me, look, I'm done, I'm done, I thought he must be the one 
to pass the baton to me. When I asked him, he said, no, I can't go in now, I've finished. So I had to find somebody else. But spiritually, on that day, Ehrman, when I took the oath, you were alongside me, um, driving me forward. And you've done it for countless people. I mean, I hope that you rest easy. I know that you're not finished anytime soon, but I hope that you can um, accept how you've changed our world, how you've moved individuals to be the very best they can be. And I'm here, the first black man to head a Oxbridge College, to head a, uh, I've headed Operation Black Vote because of you, because you took time to take a young black man under his wing and say, you can, you will, and I'll be there to support you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. that. <clears throat> it's the truth. It's Keep the going. truth. Keep going. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Julie. And I'm sorry that I have to leave shortly. That's all right. Simon, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, well we can't top that. So what we've got is Linda Bellis, OBE, who was leader of Lambeth Council during the time when Herman worked there. Take it away, Linda. Is she still here? Is Linda on, actually? If you are, Linda, um, please on mic. I know she was having some problems with her laptop. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Yes, there you are. We can. Hello. <laughs> oh, no, no, you've just put it on again. Take it off. Unmute. Unmute. Mute myself. Is, it, is that are. better? Okay. Yep. So, what I would like to recall is my uh, gratitude uh, for uh, for Herman in his role in, in as a, as a race, race advisor at Lambeth Council. Um, he and Dorothy Kuya were the first uh, um, racing advisors in the country after 1976. Uh, act came into effect. And he, uh, particularly he, has done a huge amount of work um, with uh, on race equality with the, uh, the GLC, at ILIA, uh, at the Commission for Racial Equality. I, I am full of admiration for him as an outstanding bureaucrat. Have we lost Val Have we lost you, Linda? I'm afraid it looks as if we have lost Linda. Um, she was having problems with her laptop. Ring. She was having problems with her laptop. Amir will just give her a call and see if we can get her back. Um, it's lovely to see her. Um, and I'm so glad that she made the effort and we'll try and get her back. But in the meantime, we've gone from Simon, Lord Woolley in Cambridge. Now we're going to go to our sister in Oxford. And many of you, of course, will know the wonderful Baroness Amos, Valerie Amos. You'll know her from her work at the UN. You'll know her from her work at SOAS. You know her um, from her work at, uh, in Australia. You'll, you'll know her in many different guises. And she just wanted to come on and pay tribute to Herman. Um, so um, we, we've got a rec pre-recorded um, tribute from her. So here we go. Okay, no Herman, you've been a trailblazer, a role model, a pioneer. You've spent your life in service. You've been a strong advocate, a champion, drawing attention to the serious impact of racism and discrimination in this country. You've shown courage. You've spoken truth to power. And it is you that has made all of us stronger. It's been a lifetime of trying to make sure that there is equity 
and there is justice. You have made a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Short and sweet. <laughs> yes. And, and Linda, sorry, but we have lost Linda, um, her laptop. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, we've lost that. Did, let me just jump in quickly. We, I know we've kind of finished with sport, but just one thing I wanted, picking up on a, a, a comment you made in the book um, about the way that the racism almost has moved from within the stadiums onto social media. And you're saying that you want to make sure the government and those in authority deal with Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. How close are we to anything like that? It's very difficult for me to comment in any detail or authoritatively. I'm not close enough to any negotiations and where that's at. But, but from my understanding, the, the social networks and their platforms, they have the technology to do more to stop the abuse, not only with regards to uh, football, but right across the board in terms of abuse and trolling and the way it affects people, the mental health problems, children committing suicide. There's a whole range of things that uh, are affecting our society and the way in which uh, social media, which is very powerful and very helpful and very useful, but it's also very destructive, uh, can be moderated to ensure that people can be uh, identified where they're acting in ways that's totally unacceptable uh, and are dealt with in an appropriate way. And, and, and that's all I think I was alluding to. Because what, what we're able to do and what we have done is make it much more tolerable for anyone on a football pitch, whether they're a school schoolboy or schoolgirl or a disabled person, can play football and enjoy the game and not be abused because action will be taken. Uh, and at the professional elite level, it's becoming much better regulated in that people know they will be caught and they will be dealt with and they'll be thrown out of the game or they'll be banned from attending professional mm -hmm. games. So that bit is okay. There is still a lot more in terms of opportunities behind the scenes and off the pitch and in the boardrooms. Uh, so we're able to control people's conduct at football now and they can be punished and they know you've still got people who will misbehave, but they will be caught and dealt with. What we can't do is have no control over what people can say and do to others through social media networks. And that is something that those who have the power and responsibility can do something about. And if they can't, then the government needs to regulate if it really has any uh, concern for the well-being of many people who are affected in a bad way by social media networks. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Now, we, we did want to say, because we can see in the chat, there are a lot of people who want to um, ask questions. We will mm. obviously give you time, um, probably the last half an hour or so to, to yeah. um, question. Now, you've been described as many things. I think Jeff described you as somebody who upset a lot of people. Surely not. But um, certainly you've been described as a pioneer. And um, there's uh, one of our fabulous singers, uh, composers, um, lyrical poets who would like to pay tribute to you. And we know that this is a personal favorite of yours as well. So Alexander de Great is waiting there just to pay Thanks a musical up. tribute. Thank you. Happy Thank birthday you, to you, Lord Uzi. Before I start, I'm going to do my song Windrush because you are a Windrush baby as I was. Um, yeah. But before that, this is a Trini happy birthday. Happy birthday, happy, happy birthday. This is your day, but we have all the fun. Blow out the candles and make yourself a wish. And we'll have everybody's favorite dish. I love sarsaparilla. Happy birthday, happy, happy birthday. This is your day, but we have all the fun. It's an old birthday song my mother used to sing to us. <laughs> Lovely. Remember the youth. Anyway, here we have it. They came upon the Windrush, and really, it... Um, it represents so many people who have done so many things who can't be um, honored here today, but you can be honored. So while your name is not in the song actually per se, the sentiments are. In May 48, the empire 
Windrush set sail from the Caribbean for Britain. Five hundred on board coming to seek work among them ex RAF servicemen. The fare was only twenty eight pounds ten, but that was a whole heap of money way back then. On the 22nd of June, the ship docked at Tilbury To the discomfort of the government Led by Clement Attlee They came upon the wind rush in 48 The flame of hope in their hearts whatever fate A few who formed the vanguard came through Although the doors barred, it's true that most found it hard, but survivors always find a way. They came a part of the great diaspora to claim our right to be part of what we all are. This land so fit for heroes must hand the laurels to those whose stand as history shows built multicultural Britain today. not the first. Thousands came before to put in their bit for democracy. Many of them died doing their duty to ensure that Britain could remain free. On the wind rush, they thought they were British citizens until they felt the iron fists in the velvet mittens no longer required, citizens soon became immigrants, which Mosley and Powell used to fuel ignorance. They came upon the wind rushing 48. The flame of hope in their hearts, whatever fate. A few who formed the vanguard came through, although the doors barred. It's true that most found it hard, but survivors always find a way. They came a part of the great diaspora to claim our right to be part of what we all are. This land so fit for heroes must hand the laurels to those whose stand as history shows built multicultural Britain today. The living was hard all through the fifties. Some people even believed we had tales. Then down the decades, you could read about the riots, the sus laws, school suspensions and jails. But Linton, Bob and Jazzy soul to soul, could soothe we hearts while we reach in for we gold. With high presence now in the media and some black MPs. This next generation is getting there by degrees. They came upon the wind rush in 48. The flame of hope in their hearts, whatever fate. A few who formed the vanguard came through, although the doors barred. It's true that most found it hard, but survivors always find a way. They came a part of the great diaspora. To claim our right to be part of what we all are. This land so fit for heroes must hand the laurels to those whose stand as history shows built multicultural Britain today. Plenty time has passed. Many things have changed. Some might feel we lead in fashion and sport. But make no mistake, some still find we strange. Plenty battles out there still to be fought. 
this world we share it belongs to all of we we must take care to respect multiplicity survivors of windrush know that in love and war all is fair the empire has crumbled there's only commonwealth left to share they came up on the windrush in 48 the flame of hope in their hearts whatever fate a few who formed the vanguard came through although the doors barred it's true that most found it hard but survivors always find a way they came a part of the great diaspora to claim our right to be part of what we are this land so fit for heroes must hand the laurels to those who stand as history shows built multicultural britain today magnificent thank you so much brilliant well, as i've been talking football i'm glad you love it um love I'll, it. I'll, I'll i'll get in touch with um juliet afterwards and send you an album Brilliant. Thank you very uh, much, Alexander. A couple of football and songs you. for Walter Tull and Viv Anderson in the chat for those people because they came up in the call. But you did a fantastic job. You really are. Thank you very much. Lord Oosley, fantastic to see you. Fantastic to sing for you. Lovely. Thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs> that, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Herman. Mon plaisir. Now, I'm going to hand over to the guy in the speaks. Uh, headquarters. <laughs> Thank you, Juliet. Um, just a, a quick uh, message here from Arif Ali, because I know Arif wanted to uh, join today and he wasn't able to make it. Um, okay. so he just uh, said that he's sorry he's not able to join, but wishes you all the best and thanks you for all your amazing hard work. And um, while we're on the subject of Arif Ali and Hansib, just plugging the book, guys. Don't forget you're all online. We'd like you to buy it. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's a really amazing read. And I'm I'm currently at the hostile environment. Um, I haven't read it yet. Um, I, I, I wondered if I could be um, just jump in and ask you a correct uh, question, Lord Usley. Um, in terms of the hostile environment and, and, and the amazing work you did putting it on the political agenda, um, I just wondered how you feel now. I mean, you know, with everything going on with the compensation, do you, how do you feel about the way the government's handling everything? And is there anything we as the public can do to kind of shift, um, you know, the action from the Home Office? Well, the first thing I would like to say is um, there are many good people working at a community level who have been trying their best on behalf of the individuals who are affected. And many of them work uh, endlessly and selflessly in support of those who have been affected by the government's policies and practices with regards to their status in this country and how they have been, been abused. My, my own view is that what the government has done is exactly how they've treated uh, black people for, in, for, for all the post-war period that I have been able to reflect on actions and its impact uh, on our people. And it's, it's really disgraceful that five home secretaries in this period have made promises uh, and have failed to fulfill those promises. And the worst is obviously the compensation, having come through all of this, the turmoil of people being deported, people dying, people becoming totally uh, affected in their health by not being able to work, earn money, uh, being held in custody, uh, not able to stay in their homes, uh, have been atrocious. And every, everyone in government has expressed uh, their annoyance at the way in which this has developed and has been dealt with. And yet it goes on that people are still suffering. I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how much more they can be they can be embarrassed and as far as I was able to make a small contribution was really bringing the high commissioners together here in London 
uh, back in the led by the uh, the High Commission from Barbados, the former High Commission uh, guy here, and really put pressure on government, and it was a good time to do so because it was just about the time of the uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference here in London, hosted by Her Majesty the Queen and Theresa May, and Theresa May was the architect of the of the hostile environment. And if you if you can't actually at that level get them to move to resolve something, which is so straightforward, you would think to resolve, having made the commitment, having had an investigation, having had an inquiry, having appointed someone to set up a a, a compensation scheme, um, to not resolve this by now is an absolute disgrace. And uh, sadly, I I'm not sure I can prescribe something <laughs> and because. They're what they are, and that's how they behave, and that's how they treat people, and still continue to treat people in that way. It's a I, sad situation to be saying at this time in 2021, going on 2022, yeah. they have not dealt properly and fairly with all the people affected by their actions. Yeah, thank you for that. I, th I thought it was very ironic, actually, because you start off with um, Theresa May and, and, and the, and the uh, statement she made about citizens of nowhere, and I just thought that, that, that was just so, as a statement, so astonishing, given Britain had an empire. So mm -hmm. by its very de definition, citizens of everywhere, and you, you're the ones who kind of created that empire. So, um, you know, but I, lo I loved what you said about, you know, how can we feel, feel British, you know, if we're facing hostility all the time with the go-home vans and all that kind of rhetoric. And that, that's why the book itself, by calling it, belonging it was really trying to express the feeling that particularly during the period of brexit when politicians were talking about our country and my experience going back to being a child here in london for the first time and being called a wog and a sambo and a monkey and all those things by kids i played along with it because i didn't really have an, a full appreciation how deep racial prejudice was. I knew it was there. I was beginning to understand prejudice day by day and what it meant. Um, but it was when I was confronted by adults in the street and said, we didn't win the war for you people to come here and take our jobs and our homes. And that really shook me because I had no appreciation of the contribution of black and African and Asian people from the, Carib and, uh, from the Caribbean and from Asia uh, and from Africa who have fought for the Allied forces with the Brits. Uh, in all the great wars and I had no appreciation of that and so when you then here 50 years later people talking about our country and taking back control it made you feel threatened it made you feel in spite of all you do and contribute uh, you feel as though you don't belong and then when you understand the history the history unraveled by black people themselves about their contribution over the centuries you suddenly realize it's much more than now it's been a presence that's been here and still in the in the 2020s, in the 21st century, people are talking about our country. And, and that our, you want to, a definition of our because I know from some of those politicians who they were talking about, who is in their vision, who is in their mindset about who are the owners of our country. And that ours should be all of us, but it wasn't. And it isn't. I, I wonder as well if it would ever have been uh, put on the political agenda had it not been for Chogham and and, uh, and yourself, you know, and also um, Amelia Gentleman, um, you know, her coverage in the papers. But mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to do a shout out because actually I know Dawn Hill's joined us today and I, I wanted to say thank wow. you too to Dawn Hill for all the uh, legal surgeries that um, have been hosted at the Black Cultural Archives along with Jackie McKenzie. Yes, brilliant. And and um, also, I think because uh, Jackie McKenzie and Patrick Vernon are, are both on the Black Power list, um, Jackie, I think, on the top top ten. So you know, all the work that you, Jackie, and everybody it's has been doing has been yeah. amazing. And um, mm. yeah, gratitude to you, uh, Lord Oosley, for that. Um, if I may, I just wanted to point out a comment I saw earlier in the um, chat as well at the beginning from Dr. Jim Tacredin, uh, who's a fellow mm. Guyanese. And um, he just mentioned that he had worked with you, um, I think, from the 1980s, you, you, when you yeah. were at the GLC with uh, Ansel Wong and others. 
And Absolutely. yeah, he, he just wanted me to say that he's proud of all of your achievements. So. And, and everyone else who contributed to help me, because that's, that's part of it. Without them, I wouldn't be here as well. And I, I'm very, it, it's, it's not about modesty, it's about the reality of the support system that there. You draw inspiration from seeing and hearing what others are doing and who have not succeeded in spite of all they've done to get the movement. And so you, you're glad to be able to open a few doors and you hope that people come through those doors and take it on. And right now I just feel I'm happy to know there are so many brilliant people coming through now who are expressing mm -hmm. themselves. And I've said it before and I'll say it again and I won't ever stop saying it. The next generation, we, we have so much hope for. I know that the world itself is in such a mess that you wonder what is in store for the, ne the next generation of young people. But I'm so proud to know there are so many stars coming through and they're expressing themselves in the right way and trying to bring people together and to learn with them from each other and respect the differences, but recognize we've all got to live in this society. Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh, back over to you and uh, Mia, Mia and um, Juliet. Thank you. But thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. Look, some amazing uh, questions and as always, some fabulous answers. I just want to read something again. Um, somebody else who holds you in high esteem was unable to join us because she's abroad. This is from Baroness Scotland, Patricia Scotland. Oh, and she yes. said, yes. yeah, she's on mission. She doesn't have a comms team with her, but she says, <laughs> I hope you'll be able to add my voice to all those who will come together today to celebrate Herman, our great friend and one of the most inspirational leaders of our time. His contribution to the Caribbean community in the UK and the diaspora everywhere is second to none. And it grieves me greatly that I'm not able to join you in person. Please send him my love and make sure he understands that we love and value him. And I hope to see him soonest. God bless him for all he has given to each of us. Warmest best wishes to everyone, Patricia. Thank you, very very much appreciated. Yeah, but yes, I mean um, these are people who've worked with you. Some have just walked with you. Some just know of you. But everybody's come together to pay tribute to you. Uh, what I'd like to do now, I know there are a number of people. I know um, Dawn was mentioned, Ver, um, Patrick Vernon was mentioned, and there are many others who want to say something. So okay. if you you can put it in the chat, but I'm sure you'd love to do a face-to-face. -face. So if you put your hand up, I think that's a normal thing, or just jump on, on mute, and um, put your question. Let's start with Patrick Burden. Oh, there he is. Hi, Patrick. Uh, so Ghani speaks to all those Ghani posse out there. Any Jamaicans, <laughs> any Jamaicans in the house? No, I'm just messing, I'm just messing. No, no, it's... it's um... <laughs> I mean, I've known, um, I've known you for about 20 odd years and it kind of builds onto what Simon was saying. I mean, in terms of your, you've, you've actually mentored and given guidance to a number of us over decades, quite words of support, encouragement. So I just want to give you my personal tribute as someone that I respect and admire for many decades and someone who you've given me advice and support and suggestion. And I'm reading your book and it's fantastic. What, the question is, why couldn't you get your book out 10 years earlier? No, I mean, no, but no, but seriously, but, but I, and uh, I just want to finally say your contribution has been immense. That's why when I did my campaign all those years ago, I had to grab that friends, you'll recognize uh, in that. And, uh, and you've just left, left a powerful legacy uh, for the next generation of campaigners, activists, people in the sports world, um, people doing stuff internationally as well. And just big you up and, and respect and Guyanese has definitely spoken. Thank you very much. Well, I would have liked to get the book out earlier, but I was doing so many other things. But when I started to write it, it became too much to get through in, in the time. And a lot of people wanted the book to be more about me and I wanted it to be about the issues. And so I had to go through it and chuck a lot of things out of it and focus more on when I started to write it, it was always going to be about the issue. But then it's, it suddenly became more about me and it had to, I had to in, in my view, junk that because it was I didn't want it to be about me, but really the whole process of where we've got to where we've got to. My contribution was obviously a part of that and is a part of that, but uh, I was very conscious I didn't want it to be big enough me. And that was 
why it's taken so long. But it's there now. That's good. It's thank, you, thank you for all you've done and still do. Thank you. That, that was lovely. Um, Dawn Hill has said that she would prefer not to come on, but... But she just wanted to pay tribute to Herman to thank him for everything that he's done for the Black Cultural Archives and for the, this country in particular. Thank if you. Pleasure, if it's a pleasure you are viewing, any work a man is doing, and you like him or you love him, tell him no. Don't withhold your approbation till the parson makes a wish and he lies with snowy lilies on his brow. For when all of life is over and he's underneath the clover, he cannot read his tombstone when he's dead. So, Sir Herman Oosley, we are telling it to you now. Congratulations. Yep. God bless you. Thank you very much. He's always in calling you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks, Auntie Joyce Trotman. Can you read his tombstone when he's dead? You got to tell him no. Yeah, Absolutely. right on. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I have to. I have to tell you, Lord Usley, our dear Auntie Joyce Trotman is ninety-two or ninety-three. Oh, wow. <laughs> this month. This month, indeed, on, on uh, the twenty-second. <laughs> Congratulations and well done. Thank you. Thank you. You said our heads, your head full big with pride. Your skin grow with pride. Let <laughs> me head big with pride. That, that's good. perfect. That's exactly what we want for Herman today. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Joyce. He met God. Huh? Uh, thank you, Auntie Joyce. I, you. I think we also, I saw a hand up from um, Desiree. Desiree, do you want to come in? Desiree Thompson? You have to unmute though, um, Desiree. There we go. Yeah. Happy birthday, Lord Usley. Hi, um, Desiree. <laughs> I, I worked with um, Herman um, at the Commission for Racial Equality. And um, when he led the organization and I was, uh, oh, an underling <laughs> and, um, but, Herman was the first chair because I had been, I was there um, when, when he arrived. So I had experience of a previous chair, but this was the first time that, um, you know, we were actually able to, he was personable. And um, Herman was very generous. He was a very generous leader who um, gave us, built confidence in those that he worked with, which, uh, and he motivated us, um, you know, enormously. This was the first time that we actually saw um, a leader who actually came in early, seven o'clock in the morning, you would see Herman, you know, in the lift and he would be there working away. And he didn't kind of filter off at lunchtime and didn't return. He would be there late as well. He was always, so that uh, motivated us to do our best for him. And, um, and in turn, I think that made such an impact um, with those that he worked with and with me in particular, because I learned so much um, during that period. Um, and he, he gave us an, and me an opportunity to work and to actually develop while I was at the CRE. So Herman, I would like to thank you for that because it has also enabled me to go on to doing so many other things. Mm -hmm. And so happy birthday. Thank you again. Happy to contribute to the, your development, which is wonderful to know. Well done. And thank you. Uh, that's absolutely lovely. I don't know, um, another birthday was celebrated not so long ago. Um, Uncle Eric, is he here? Yeah, Uncle Eric's, Uncle Eric's definitely here. Don't know, Uncle Eric, do you want to come in? You'd need to unmute first though. While we're just waiting for um, Uncle Eric to unmute, I just wanted to say that there's a message here from Ian Phillips, and um, he just says, thanks, Lord Usley, an amazing intervention into the landscape of our lives, an interruption to our life patterns that had stalled in so many ways to make a difference. Thank you. Um, right. Uncle Eric, I don't know if Uncle Eric, I'm going to see if I can ask him to unmute. Um, somebody else might have a hand up yes i know we've got who else have we got online um 
Anne Brathwaite, uh, Dingen, anybody? Uh, Margaret Busby's online. I don't know if you want to say oh, anything. Come on. Everybody's feeling Zoom shy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so would anyone like to say something? Of all, all those names that were just mentioned. Anyone? Uh, Michael Ohorjura is online. Luke Daniels. Um, Look, Colin King. King. Colin <laughs> King. Yeah. Come in, Colin. Um, just unmute if you can. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say a big, big. I didn't know you had a birthday. I thought you were as important as the Queen. I thought you just have three a year. <laughs> um, can I just say, as somebody, I don't think I'm as illustrious or in that elite bracket as the people here today. But can I just represent all the people who have actually passed on, the people that are incarcerated in our mental health and criminal justice system, that um, Sir Herman has been a, a true, authentic advocate of people whose lives don't feel mattered. But I also must say, Sir Herman, we've got a massive struggle in the area of mental health, which is the new sort of slavery in British society. We need your assistance with two things. The review of the Mental Health Act that's continued to demonize and misconstruct and misdiagnose somebody who has schizophrenia for 40 years. You have been unbelievable as a savior and a liberator and we need your spirit. But more importantly, over 30 people have died in this mental health system. And I'm gonna ask a special praise that you give to Ardia Lewis and Marcia Riggs who have carried on one of the most massive campaigns and icons and you recommend the, their significance and their position and the support. I love you, Sir Herman. If you've got any money left over, please give it to me because I need it really badly. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. <laughs> I love your message. I'll do what I can. All the best for you. <laughs> Is there anyone else with the out of the cupboard? I'll get the bank manager out of the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I oh, Eric, 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 Eric. Eric, Eric Hunter. Uncle Eric, I think you accidentally put yourself back on mute again. Um while you're trying to sort that out, just uh, Margaret Busby has said many congratulations. I mean, and here we are. Uncle Eric, go ahead. There you go. I feel very peeved. Can you hear me? We can hear yeah, you. We can't see yeah. you though. I, you can't. Well, that's all right. Uh, and <laughs> you're better off not seeing me, I think. <laughs> Uncle Eric, I'm afraid um, you're going to tell me off. I, I hear that no, sound in your voice. No, no, I feel very peeved because I, I could not hear anything for over an hour. Oh no! Wow. I could not hear a word. Not all everything. Everything I did. Anyway, let that pass. Um. Herman Osley, are you there? I'm here. You're there? Yes, Eric. My good, I think we're both of the same generation, almost, 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 eh? almost. But what I would like to ask you is, what can we do about the Black History Month? How can we, you, you're, you're one of the main persons who have started this ball um, going. How can we get the voice which says black history is longer than a month? How can we move away from that month as though, um, as we said, it's, it's, the, it's the black black month month, black pound month. How can we move away from that and get the society to, real, to realize that our history is their history also, is intertwined? How can we? Any, 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 any ideas? Well, I, I can't say I've got an answer, but I, I do understand what you're saying. And one's got to accept. Well, firstly, I, I must say that I don't, I can't accept the recognition you're giving to me of, of being one of the creators or, or contributors to the creation of Black History Month, because there are other colleagues who did hard work and they deserve the praise as they do. And, the situation is one in which to get Black History Month up and getting the coverage that it's getting now shows year on year progress in the way in which the media, particularly the mass media, 
uh, beginning to pick up and reflect uh, issues during that month. But what is what is right from what you're saying is is how we see black people uh, of wherever they come from, whatever their circumstances, being reflected in modern day life because of their hard work, their achievements, their contributions. And I think that outside of Black History Month is helping us not only to see black people contributing, uh, not as much as they should be able to be seen doing, uh, but we, we're beginning to see increasingly them stand, being projected as successful, as articulate, as intelligent, uh, and playing a part in our society. But also, um, there is also now a respect for the fact that there has been a long history of black people's presence in Britain, running through the centuries, uh, where that contribution has helped to shape Britain the way that it is now and the direction it's going into becoming a, an exemplary and role model multicultural society. So I think there is a door that's slightly ajar. It's how it's pushed and the people who have to push it uh, are those who are most influential, those black people who've achieved uh, the status of being in positions where they can influence those who can push this on. And we've got to look to them to help to open that door fully. I must say that I appreciate, from a personal point of view, how much more I'm learning about that history because more people, certainly during the month of October, are contributing to making it much more aware uh, through all the productions, both on television, radio, but also in the mass media, as well as what black organizations across the country are doing. Personally, I think it's better to have the month than nothing, but I think you're right. We've got to find a way of making sure people have a better understanding that Black History Month is not the 30, 31 days of October. It's about the 365 each year. Well said. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Uncle Eric. Thank you for that, yeah. Eric Huntley. Black and White History Month is British Colonial History Month. And <laughs> British Colonial History Month. If they didn't come to our country, we couldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. That is true. That is that's another debate, Joyce. That's next week. Diana speaks next week. Ain't <laughs> nothing to do with black people. They hand us to that like a sop to Cerberus. Hey, give it to them and hand them a month and stay back and look on. When they were the perpetrators. Well, it is it is how what, what Herman's saying there is how yeah. we use it. Yeah. And that least is opening eyes and minds. British so. colonial history month. <laughs> black and white history month. White man right. and black man made in brown them around sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and auntie, auntie oh, Joy, black, if you're talking <laughs> color, is black and white meat in brown them around Joyce, you're <laughs> absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's the discussion for Guyana Speaks. That's the next one. I think that's what we need to We actually, Auntie, Auntie Joyce, we, we have the one. Auntie Joyce, we have the perfect program for you on the 31st of October, so we'll definitely need to get you in for that. Sure. But um, <laughs> oh, back if it's you, Juliet, because I'm not yes. sure if you've got um, we're, Cerberus. Hand we're, them we're, 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 we want to give um, um, Herman um, the last... <laughs> I'm still laughing, so Herman, we want to give like Herman a, a reply, but before we do that, we have another um, musical contributor who uh, would like to contribute his own interpretation of a beautiful song. Somebody was asking earlier, who's Patrick? What about the Jamaicans? Well, okay, Patrick, we're gonna be singing a, a Jamaican song now, at least a song that emanates from Jamaica and then rules around the world. And um, Keith Waite is here. Everybody knows the um, international flautist, Keith Waite, who is an amazing mainstay and musical composer. Uh, and has done so much in terms of bringing the musicality of the Caribbean and Guyana, the rainforest, and also the popularity of the flute to so many young people and international audiences. 
and he's just going to play his short tribute to Lord Oosley. Keith, are you there? So I have a question for Keith, because I think he was online, but I think we have a recording that we're going to, oh, to play. Oh, it is a recording, absolutely right. This He's is, not okay. going to do it live. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. So let me just see if I can share my screen. Thank and you. let's listen to this. Can I just check? Can you hear that? Yes. You can, perfect. I can, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Lovely. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. Superb as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. I think he might have dropped off. Actually, he was on. Uh, <laughs> but he, he, Keith, is he still there? Well done, Keith. Yes. Well done. To go, but yeah, no, that was nice. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Have redemption good. song there. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, Herman, it's the last few minutes before we need to close down, I believe. Um, yep. Can I just ask for your thoughts? I mean, loads of tributes, your tributes about your generosity, about your leadership, your motivational, and clearly a lot of love coming your way. So what's next? <laughs> <laughs> well, firstly, let me, let me thank all of you who have organized for today and it's been great i didn't know i'll be getting so much love um mm -hmm. but that's nice because i feel that i've reached the end of what i consider to be my openly public service uh, and 
the rest of my life I'm really dedicating to my family uh, because by and large I've neglected them as I've been helping others and it's always been the case that I respond to people when they approach me looking for assistance and I think it's right that I should have responded. I'm delighted that so many people appreciate what I've done and they've taken the time to <clears throat> make the tributes that they have today, especially Gordon and Paul and Jeff um, on the sporting side, and I know there are many others. And I've also received many uh, tributes from people who have heard about the book, read the book, and surprised me by telling me that without me even knowing that they saw me as their mentor. And really surprising, but very heartwarming. And what I am most particularly delighted uh, as I try to relax, I've got a few health problems I'm dealing with, is how much, op how much optimism I have for the future, notwithstanding all the problems that I know exist. Because I see the talent of our young people, I see the their awareness and articulateness in the way that they're expressing themselves and recognizing the responsibility they, responsibilities they have to show how good they are, how important they are as representatives of our people and people like us to ensure that they are seen as citizens of the world, but also citizens of this country, making a valuable contribution. And Someone like Gordon must be really proud when he sees some of his stars like Marcus Rashford and Tyrone Mings, how much they're doing, how, how wonderful these young people are speaking out, how articulate they are, how powerful they come across. And, and they have that balance of moderation, but also strength in their message. And I think we've got to be look at that, look at those, not only in, in sport and examples I just gave you, but through the range of society, you're seeing the talents coming through. And we've got to give as much as we can through education to all the young people in British society to understand not only the black history and that contribution, uh, but also what is going on now. And once again, coming back to sport and why sport was so important to me in the latter part of my years in public service is because I recognise the value for me of how much I learned from being in team sport and relying on other people and knowing that other people relied on me. But how much I learned about other people, how much I learned about racism because it was being thrown at me uh, almost from the moment I put on my first pair of football boots, um, people were giving you abuse. But how you then have to counter that. And from my other experiences was how really uh, I could use that learning to carry through uh, the other processes that were necessary in helping institutions to change. And the thing about sport is that it, once again, if you take football by itself, but the whole range of sport, is that it is the one area where people have to interact with each other, participate and contribute with each other to the goals of what you're seeking, not only to do, but to achieve. And in sport, there's a great opportunity to learn with and from each other about each other. And that's what's going to make society uh, much more coherent and cohesive. And I see this once again through football in their academies, with their curriculum, with the learning, not just to become good footballers or even elite footballers or to become out of football because you don't succeed. But what they learn from each other, being black and white and brown and male and female and boys and girls, it is a great opportunity. It is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's its own university of knowledge for the next generation. And coupled with what we have to do through the school curriculum, through further and higher education opportunities, uh, we can see a society that moves forward. If we can then get the leaders of this country, the people with the power, the people who make the decisions, and those decisions are what determine what is going on now at the present time. If those people with the power can't resolve in a simple way, using all that they already know 
of what could be done to achieve the successes of a more coherent, just, and fair society, then all the other things that are taking place that are good are still going to be undermined by the prejudice and the ongoing dynamic of racism that exists that they won't tackle. So from my point of view, in thanking you all for all your tributes and for acknowledging what I've done in my contribution, my little contribution, but backed by so many other people and what they have done, and so many other people that I've learned from and continue to learn from, is that I believe, and I know that if I was sitting in an institution with the power, the decisions I would make would have to be decisions that I know will impact in a way that the most needy will benefit, the targeted groups would get the uh, benefits of what we are doing. And I'm obviously I'm speaking from a public service perspective and reflecting the issues around public services. But it does apply right across all our corporations, all our voluntary organizations, and all our, our businesses and public services. Those people at the top are the people who will enable us to achieve a just and fair society by using their power in the decision-making in a way that reflects opportunities for everyone and value and respect people, whatever their circumstances, whatever their background. And that's what I am looking forward to happening, certainly during the rest of my limited life ahead of me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Much appreciated. And I love you all. And I do really genuinely appreciate everyone along the way who's helped me. Because although you've given me the products today, it could not the things I've done could not have happened without others. And that I would like to stress because I fully appreciate all the help that I've had, all the luck that I've had, all the opportunities that I've had. And I try to use those opportunities as best as I can to help. Uh, to, to, to help to move the agenda of inequalities towards equality. Plenty love to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank As you, um, um, Joy said, plenty love to plenty you. Plenty love. There's, there's, a few other, there's a few other comments, Julia. I don't know. If I can just quickly read them, because um, Luke Daniels just wanted to say it's been fantastic listening in. Um, he's finally got his computer going. Happy birthday, so easily. Always been an inspiration to follow. Um, and you. then Jennifer, I'm not sure which Jennifer, I haven't got a surname here, but it says Jennifer. Lord Oosley, thank you for hosting the annual tea parties at the House of Lords on behalf of the <laughs> Phoenix Trust. Um, yeah. yes. Lots of happy birthdays, including happy from birthday. um, Valerie's sister Colleen, who is at the oh, yes. head yeah. of, uh, as, as you know, the Amos Bursary, which um, mentors bright young people from um, African and Caribbean, um, uh, what should I say, inheritance, descendants really, and has started to work with girls as well. Uh, great words. Happy Earth Day. Thank you for everyone. That's from Sandra. From Faith, thank you for the event. Happy birthday to you, dear Herman. There's Lots also of people. Um, Michael Ohajuro saying, learning from, respect for, and in awe of the great man. Herman's humanity is manifest in himself and those who've spoken about him this afternoon. So happy and honored to have listened to Herman and the other speakers. And then there's also Anne Brathwaite, in all the various arenas, Herman operated in over half a century. He remained a quiet, single-minded and principled stalwart for uplifting Black Britain. Happy birthday, Herman, and all best wishes. If I could just add to that, I actually have to say, I've loved feeling the passion and energy from um, you this afternoon. Um, Lord Oosley, and I have to say, I love the way it's also captured in your book. And I love the very final sentence of the book, which if I may just quickly read it. Um, 
it says for me there is no next time it is now for me that means heading for the hills caring for family and friends finding some solace in the final phase of life and aspiring to belonging to a community of communities in which there is no tolerance for ignorance prejudice hatred abuse and discrimination and uh, i just find it such an inspiring um book so thank you so much for writing it and um thank you hansard for publishing it yeah thank you Hans. now herman did you get anything in the post yesterday have you got it to hand i haven't got it to hand no but i have oh, got okay. something in the post yesterday it's a <laughs> okay. photograph Enjoy. of the book a framed photo of the cover of the book and thank you very much for that Okay. Excellent. Well, it's been our pleasure to share this time with you, to share your birthday, and also to reminisce about a life well spent. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done, everybody. Well done. Um, Juliet and Mia, thank you so, so much for bringing this all together. Um, you know, as Gaida speaks, we really, really appreciate it. And for those who've enjoyed today, can I just say that next weekend on Sunday, we have um, Fred Degar and um, Fred is going to be joining us to talk about his new memoir, which is called um, A Year of Plagues, uh, A Year of Plagues, A Memoir of 2020. So that should be uh, really good fun. And you'll find that on um, Eventbrite as well, our usual Eventbrite and, and on our Facebook page. And also we've got um, Arthur Dorrington, Claudia Tomlinson and Professor John Rickford on the 31st of October. So um, that date's also available on Eventbrite if you'd like to join us for that. But um, nothing can surpass today. It's been an absolutely wonderful event for us. So thank you, Juliet. Thank, thank you, Mia. Yeah. Huge and immense thanks to you, Lord Oosley. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we used to say three cheers for Lord Usley. Hip hip! Hooray! 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 Hooray!